Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Mara Bernazani. I'm the Communications Coordinator at the UNH Interoperability Lab, and I will serve as your moderator today. Today's webinar is titled New and Expanded, Wi-Fi Test and Measurement Assures Performance at the Network Edge. I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Lincoln Lavoie. He's the Senior Engineer in Broadband Technologies at the UNH IOL. He is responsible for the technical management of the broadband access technology grounds, including DSL, GPON, and wireless. In addition, he also serves on the Broadband Forum Board of Directors as the Vice Chair. After his presentation, we will have a Q&A session. We encourage you to submit your questions at any time during today's presentation. We'll address them all at the end. We'd also love to hear from you, so please share anything from today's um, news on your social channels using hashtag UNHIOL and hashtag Wi-Fi webinar. There will be a recorded version of today's webinar available for your download on our YouTube page and also on the UNH IOL website. We're excited to have everyone here with us today. So now we'll, uh, let's get started. Thank you, Mara, uh, and welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, we will be covering a variety of topics uh, on the Wi-Fi testing, uh, specifically how these apply to the edge of the network uh, and why that's becoming increasingly important uh, in today's connected society. So just kind of touching briefly upon our agenda, we'll talk a little bit about what does it mean for the wireless at the edge, uh, dive into the testing environment as well as the specifics of that testing. Uh, and then kind of conclude by going over the industry directions and, and what is the path that's being taken there and how we can uh, work with everyone on their wireless testing. So if we look at the evolution of wireless at the edge, really it's becoming a world where nearly all the access to the internet is coming through a wireless path at the end user. Uh, and that really turned wireless into uh, a key uh, in factor of the quality of experience. For those that this is a new term, quality of experience is about the user's perception of the network performance. Uh, so it's, it's not necessarily a latency measurement, it's not necessarily a packet drop measurement, it's really about perception of what they, they see happening in their connection. Uh, and that's really what the name of the game becomes when it talk, start talking about wireless's impact on uh, the QoE. Because from a customer's perspective, it, it doesn't matter whether it's the wireless, whether it's the internet connectivity, whether it's the broadband connection, all of it, it just looks the same to them. And so if we, we consider that, then uh, from a service provider's perspective, it really is that poor wireless experience gives you poor quality of, poor wireless performance gives you poor customer experience, and poor quality of experience leads to user complaints. And, and the name of the game really is trying to eliminate the user complaints, right? So the, the challenge service providers have to improve the, the quality of experience for their customers or they risk losing those customers. Uh, and looking to that, we have to provide a solution where we provide customers with well-known, tried and tested solutions, uh, cooperate with manufacturers to test the Wi-Fi equipment before field deployment, uh, and really looking to that, we're looking at using repeatable testing to ensure that we can set baselines and we understand what the performance is going to be. And really this leads to being able to predict what the, the performance in the field would be and then from that prediction of the performance, predicting what the quality of experience would be for those users. So thinking about what is a typical broadband home uh, in today's uh, connected world. You probably have you know, an average of about four family members and given today's broadband deployments, you're likely having a single access point covering that home with, with 802.11 based wireless. Probably have at least one laptop into the house. Probably have at least four smartphones, assuming that your family has uh, children of age to be having the smartphone devices. And so all of these devices are connected and consuming that wireless path. Don't forget the tablets. And last but not least, you probably have at least two media devices that are streaming multimedia. And so as you can see, the, the number of devices that you really have in the home is growing. Uh, and that really does mean that, that that wireless path becomes the predictor for the quality of experience. And so poor wireless performance 
can lead to poor perception of the internet connection uh, not working or meeting up to the expectations of the customer and that can lead to those complaints. Continuing looking at what we have for the wireless at the edge, there's obviously been a number of generations of technology. And so we've seen Wi-Fi over the years evolve from 802.11a uh, or g uh, for the, the 5 gigahertz or the 2.5 gigahertz uh, spectrums. We've seen that evolve towards 802.11n. We've then seen wireless performance evolve to AC with Wave 1 and now most recently the Wave 2 technologies. And what that really comes down to is the access point, the technology that's deployed in the access point is going to be a, a huge impactor and dominate that performance inside the home. Uh, and the, you really end up with a maximum performance uh, when you are able to align all of the stations uh, with the access points uh, capabilities or technology. Uh, throughout this presentation, I am going to be uh, referring to access points and stations where the access point is obviously the, the base station for the wireless and the, the station is the typical client uh, that you refer to that. And this is kind of a, the standard nomenclature in the 802.11 space. So if we look at what are the performance impactors, they can kind of break these down into a number of categories and then the categories will help us uh, kind of define what we're doing and how we're approaching our testing. So we have the AP location, and this really kind of determines the range that you would have between the AP and the client. Uh, and so the range is that amount of the signal attenuation that you see uh, impacting the, the reception and transmission of, of data between those two devices. We have the number of stations uh, in the, the environment, and so this really can be thought of as a fairness test where you need to get fair access onto that wireless media and you're hoping that the access point is, has got some QoE and QoS capabilities built into it to, to address that. Uh, there's obviously uh, other systems and wireless systems in play, uh, and so that was be causing noise and impactors into the wireless uh, technology from that space. And then we have uh, changes to the network. And so obviously many of the devices that we went through earlier are mobile devices. They're usually kind of quote unquote tethered to their, their owner. Uh, and they move with that owner, and the, those devices leave the network, they join the network, uh, and all of those things essentially consume cycles on the network uh, and can lead to operational issues and, and impact from there. And then last but not least, uh, there's obviously the question of interoperability. Uh, and so that's the mix of devices. Again, with all the different generations of technology, no customer in a home is going to be upgrading every device all at the same time to keep the technologies the same. Uh, and there's an expectation that when you bring a new device into that, that network, that the network continues to perform as it was performing previously without any uh, major degradation or something like that. And the name of the game is predicting what is that quality. Uh, and so what we're, the end goal here is we're trying to be able to, before any of these devices hit the field, before they get into real deployments or, or into real customers' hands, really the name of the game is being able to predict what is that quality of experience going to be, and, and what steps can you do to do that? And so what we postulate here is if you have testing in those above categories and you're ensure that your, your performance is meeting an adequate baseline, then you're actually going to be able to kind of have a predictor of what your quality of experience scores would be out in the field. So diving from there into creating a test environment, <clears throat> the University of New Hampshire has built up uh, a fairly substantial wireless testing environment as of late, you, uh, partnering with Octoscope using their Octobox equipment. Uh, this equipment essentially allows us to address the four key areas uh, that we just covered in terms of range, noise, operational issues, interoperability, and then also provides a future-proof path for mesh and roaming testing uh, as we see the number of access point devices increasing inside the home. And so if we look at how do we go about building uh, that testing environment, what are the things to consider when you're looking at this? Uh, a lot of this is really based on a good scientific method principles. Uh, you wanna have a single variable under control uh, while you're doing the test. You wanna have repeatability in that test, and so you need an environment that's gonna to speak to low noise, you need some level of automation capability so you're not dependent on time interactions of a human, uh, which can be varied uh, test case to test case or test run to test run. 
Uh, and so if we look at that compared to the, the test environment that we're building up here, uh, covering today's slides, we're implementing a, a cabled path between the devices. And so you're able to ensure that what you're testing is a single variable under test and you're not dealing with uh, environmental factors that can change as things come and go. Uh, you're using building up that channel and that path using attenuators and a channel emulator. And so that uh, speaks towards that repeatability uh, need where you're not dependent again upon the environmental factors. You're not dependent upon any temperatures or, or device placement as much. Uh, and so you have a, a predictable multipath between all of those devices uh, that's repeatably and can be used uh, time and time again. Uh, and then last but not least, in terms of the repeatability and the control aspect, uh, as you notice from the picture that those chambers are, are really wireless isolation chambers and so they're meant to eliminate any external noise sources uh, from those environmental factors as well. And so you're not seeing uh, any noises from you know, your own personal cell phone as you're, you're operating a test or anything else that might be in the nearby space uh, contributing to that, that RF environment. We also are looking towards future proof and, and some amount of flexibility. And so uh, going from the picture, we, we are using near field antennas, so you're not necessarily needing to cable into a device. Uh, and that speaks to the flexibility of the setup. It also gives us some flexibility in terms of dealing with rotational or, or uh, spatial setup. Uh, and then also, uh, for those that are thinking towards the future uh, technologies, right now everything is really focused on the four spatial streams, but in the future we're going to see additional spatial streams uh, as we increase up to eight devices, or eight spatial streams per device. So what does this all look like in a uh, kind of more detailed diagram if we were to pick it apart? So it consists of uh, the isolation chambers, uh, so the box 26 devices as well as the box 38, uh, kind of nomenclature for the size of the, the actual chamber. Uh, and then inside each of those is near field antennas uh, that actually couple that, that signal path into the device or the device under test. There's the multi-path emulator, so this is really the heart of the setup. This is a uh, channel emulator based on the 802.11 uh, Model B uh, specifications. Uh, and included in that is also a, a attenuator that attenuates all four of the paths uh, and, that make up that multi-path. And those two devices together allow you to basically emulate some amount of range as well as be able to control that range uh, through an automation capability. We have the additional attenuators off to the right-hand side there. Those uh, allow you to basically control paths between the additional boxes. Uh, we'll cover those as we talk about roaming and, and uh, mesh texting. We have uh, the partner device, which is the, the emulated stations. That's the capability where we can actually emulate the operational uh, aspects of this, as well as loading up an AP with X number of additional stations so that you can start simulating uh, that real world environment. Uh, so the AP under test isn't only communicating with a single partner, it's communicating with other devices all at the same time. Uh, and then last but not least, we have the noise generator where the, this is the ability to actually add in that external interference and external factors that would be impacting the wireless receiver. So we'll cover some noise cases in detail uh, in a few slides here. Diving down into the specific testing. So uh, that first category we had talked about was our range testing. So really looking at being able to control the path between two devices. And so you can see it kind of graying out the, the test setup here and honing in on the, the devices that are used from that. You're, you're really kind of emulating between a, a virtual path between a device under test in box 38 and a partner device uh, in box 26 above. And then you're controlling that channel path through the multipath emulator where you're actually able to vary the quote unquote distance between those two devices. And so that's where you're able to build up a performance measurement uh, between the devices. That performance measurement can typically be measuring the total throughput between the devices, uh, but the other things that we're also starting to look at and see of increasing interest is, is uh, analysis of the latency and the jitter between those, those devices. And uh, we're going to be coming up with some additional uh, work in the future where we're really honing in on uh, application layer testing where you're actually seeing the impact of the latency and the jitter on some of the higher layer protocols, which can be incredibly sensitive uh, to those, those impactors, even 
uh, at the TCP level that can also be a significant impactor. So look for some more work from there coming to, a, uh, coming to you from the University of New Hampshire as well. Uh, and then lastly, speaking to this specific test setup, the uh, device under test in box 38 does include a turntable. Uh, and then what that is really aspect is aiming for uh, measuring the spatial uniformity of that uh, performance. And so ensuring that as the device under test is rotated through 360 degrees, you don't see any significant degradation in uh, performance or anything like that. So if we wanted to dive into some data uh, for the range testing, what we have here on, on the right is performance measurements. These are, are really throughput bitrate measurements uh, for two real devices in the lab. Uh, and what you're able to see is, is based on a, a measurement and the attenuation or the, the range between a device, as well as the measurement being taken over four different rotations. So these are just 90 degree angles of, of that device in the chamber. Uh, relative to those near field antennas. And so you're able to see that, yeah, there is some variation in performance uh, as you have different rotations. Uh, so not all, everything is created equal, uh, but they're approximately the same. And then you can see the typical roll off that you would expect as, as the attenuation is increasing between the two devices. Um, from there, you can actually get an average performance measurement. So you can see how the device performs over kind of averaging all of those angles together. And you can see the, the performance uh, for client to station, client, client to uh, access point, as well as access point to client. The other thing to consider, I don't have graphs plotted here, but you can uh, also do measurements for latency and jitter, which is the, the time discrepancies between packets uh, entering and leaving the wireless network. And as I indicated before, those can have a significant impact on things like TCP as well as the upper layer applications. One of the key aspects that we're aiming at here uh, in the lab is really trying to ensure that we have repeatability uh, from the system. So that, that way, when we can be able to use the test setup in the future or repeat a measurement, we expect to see the consistent measurement, uh, consistent repeatability between those measurements. Uh, and what that means is that we can then aim towards setting up absolute performance bars. And so the, the difference there is if you think about an absolute bar, that would be saying that a device needs to achieve a throughput of, say, 80 megabits or 100 megabits up to a certain uh, point, and then being able to set that as an absolute bar as opposed to a, a relative performance where maybe you would compare how the device performed with no attenuation out to an attenuation at 30 dB or 40 dB. That would be more of a relevant measurement. Um, the absolute measurement is nice because that actually allows you to, to set a benchmark comparison between two different devices where the relevant device is really comparing a device to itself. So moving along in our, our pass through the testing, uh, to the second category, really this is focusing on AP and fairness, uh, where you actually have the access point having to interact with multiple stations. Uh, for those of you that are uh, very familiar with the uh, 802.11 specifications with the Wave 2 uh, devices, previous to that, uh, the access point wasn't able to quote unquote talk in multiple directions. And so Obviously, the, the airtime fairness is a, is a key factor uh, that you need to think and consider when evaluating the, the customer's quality of experience inside a home or inside a, a broadband residence uh, where you have multiple uh, stations all communicating with that AP simultaneously. Uh, and the thing to remember is that even with a Wave 2 AP, not every single client is going to be Wave 2 capable, and so you will see an impactor on that as well. What we're doing in the setup here is we're actually using that, that PAL device to emulate any number of stations. Uh, those stations can be a mixture of technologies, so you could have 802.11 and 802.11n. Uh, you could also have uh, different attenuations or different kind of varied distances between those devices. And so the end goal is to really load up that access point and ensure that there's a fair kind of perception and, and airtime access to each of those stations. And then we can actually vary uh, some of the functions of the, the wireless connectivity. So we can look at the changing, enabling quality of service functions. Uh, we vary the distance between each of those devices. And it's not shown in this diagram, but we can also in enable uh, a real device at the same time as using the emulated devices. So we could stick a uh, iPhone in box 26 up at the top there and then have uh, five or six emulated devices at the same time that you're making a measurement through that, that iPhone. So we're able to really 
hone in on a number of real world scenarios using real devices that you would expect to see in the lab. So for those of you that were worried that we were gonna have to look at a, a test setup and data uh, for every single one of those categories, I, I will spare you from that monotony. Uh, and really kind of just, we're gonna run through the remaining uh, test setups and scenarios instead of diving into to detailed data analysis on today's webinar. Uh, so in moving to the second set of testing or the third set of testing, looking at the operational issues. And so this is where you have changes to the network occurring uh, fairly regularly inside a device. You would have uh, people coming and going uh, from the network, the association, disassociation, you have authentication. Uh, all of those uh, really do have impact on the access point. All of those can certain uh, processing power and cycles on that side of things. Uh, and you can have uh, various things happening from the 802.11 perspective. So again, you can have mixed and matched specifications and standards. That's going to lead to uh, different capabilities and, and kind of state machine flows. And then you're also going to have uh, varying data rates potentially based on those attenuations uh, between the emulated stations and the access point. And those mixed data rates are also something to consider inside this, this testing. Next, we dive into testing noise. Uh, and so this is where you're actually looking at the AP or a station operating under a noisy environment. Uh, inside the 802.11 spaces, there are a number of noises that you need to consider. Uh, first and foremost, there's obviously uh, the aspect where you could have other 802.11 systems. So this would really take place inside like a, a MDU type dwelling, so a multi-dwelling unit where you might have uh, apartments or condos, et cetera, uh, with other 802.11 networks that are utilizing uh, either overlapping channels uh, in the space, either partially or fully, uh, but they're not participating directly in the 802.11 network that is your customer's network, and so they can impinge upon the quality uh, of that network. Then you have other technologies that would be coming into play. So you have technologies that overlap in the frequency space. Bluetooth, Zigbee uh, are two kind of primary examples that you would see there. Next, you have external sources, so things like the dreaded uh, microwave oven that operates at the 2.4 gigahertz uh, space and, you know, where you can have a customer that every time they run their microwave sees their performance go down. Uh, and last but not least, uh, there's regional sources where you would have radar systems. Um, so anything from uh, airport radar to uh, weather Doppler radar uh, involves in that space and, and those, those systems uh, really have two key aspects. First, um, that's inside the five gigahertz space, and so you'll see that uh, becoming an increasingly important factor as more people move to the 802.11 AC technologies, uh, which are operating in that five gigahertz band. And then also, you'll see uh, the requirement where you have to uh, be aware of the radar and avoid it because it's a mandatory uh, requirement in many regulatory uh, regions that you actually do adjust your channel and your frequency selection based on avoiding that, that radar. Um, the other part of the, the testing with the noise is that just avoiding or avoiding uh, congested channels just in general, so avoiding 802.11 space uh, where your neighbors might be using one of the channels and then you wanna vacate to a channel that's less used and having the access point be able to dynamically make those measurements and, and configuration changes uh, can really kind of key up to your customer's perceived quality where they don't see any of that happening on their network, they just see a network that's functioning properly without any, any major issues. As I mentioned, the radar avoidance is something where it's a, a mandatory feature in many regulatory environments and so something to be considered and tested. Last but not least, we have uh, the interrupt category. So this is obviously looking at uh, different devices out there and their uh, applicability to the network and the quality of experience. Uh, typical partners might be uh, new uh, access points. So some of the bleeding edge uh, wave two type devices from Netgear Linksys uh, are two common ones that we see a lot of usage of. And then you have the ever popular stations where you have the iPad, the iPhone, Apple TV, Google Pixels, Chromecasts. Um, the, obviously the number of, of handheld mobile devices goes on and on and on. Um, there's obviously laptops that can come into that mix. 
but really the, the devices and doing the interoperability testing and having an understanding how those devices perform is, is key to understanding what your customers' uh, expectations are gonna be on that network. Not all of these devices have the same antennas, not all of them have the same radiation patterns, uh, not all of them are gonna perform at the same uh, ability when placed into a stressed mode, i.e. there's noise and such. And so being able to predict how well your device is going to play with these other common devices and then also how well they're going to play when those devices are on, in a stressed environment uh, really can help you kind of predict that quality of experience for your customer. Now we're kind of moving towards a couple of more futuristic um, test cases. And so the number of APs that you see inside uh, a typical broadband uh, connected resident is, is going to continue to increase. And, and so we're already starting to see that now with multiple AP solutions coming out into the environment. And so with multiple APs, now you need to, to start considering the roaming between those devices. And so this is really looking at um, the client uh, or station moving from AP1 to AP2 in some type of a coordinated factor. Uh, inside enterprise applications, this has been done for quite a while using an enterprise management solution where you'd actually have all of the APs participating uh, in that management solution and then being able to have a controlled migration or a controlled roaming uh, from AP to AP uh, with some direction being given from that management solution. Uh, what this is new as is really you're starting to see that type of a, a uh, deployment and an architecture moving away from the pure enterprises where you might have 30 or 40 or 50 of these access points into the, the broadband connected residences where you might only have one or you know, two or three of these access points and some level of coordination between them. Uh, so if we look at how you're actually doing that testing here, uh, that's where you start enabling the, the third uh, wireless enclosure or box there. Uh, and then you have the ability to control that path using two of the stepped attenuators to basically vary the distance from access point one to access point two. Uh, and the nice thing of having the, the two attenuators that you can control independently of one another is you can actually start really honing in on what happens when the, the range or the distance or the attenuation from those two devices isn't that different and you're forcing the system to really have to make a decision about where it's going to, to park the, the station so that you uh, are able to validate uh, that you're not having it toggle back and forth between APs, which could really impact your customer's uh, perceived quality of that connection because they would see either losses or increased latencies or jitters. Uh, and then we're also starting to see new applications entering the, the, the marketplace as well. And so this, this is commonly referred to as like a client steering application uh, where the access points are able to actually communicate um, between uh, two different devices or between the two different access points and then steer the client. Uh, and then on the bleeding edge of that, you're actually even seeing uh, work being done where they'd, they'd like to actually open that up so that even if the access points are coming from varying vendors and varying uh, manufacturers, that there's some interoperability between those access points so that you could actually do that client steering between those devices. And so these things are definitely coming out uh, as further down the path. Uh, and will be of, I think, critical interest to ensuring the quality of, of that wireless connection on the edge. With the, the roaming testing, kind of a, a more specific path of that then becomes what happens when the connectivity between those access points isn't a purely wired connection. Uh, and so this is where the mesh comes into play. And so you might have kind of the root access point inside a home, and then a second access point where that second access point is actually backhauled uh, between uh, using a wireless path to that first access point, and then the, the station is actually connecting to that second access point. And so you actually have two wireless hops inside the link. Um, so in this case, you're actually looking at a fairly complex case of how does the, the attenuation and the link between each of those wireless paths uh, impact your testing, but then you're also consider the roaming case as well as interference cases of what happens when you start varying any of, of the uh, parameters or putting it into kind of a stressed operational mode uh, on the network and, and what happens to that actual quality of experience. So again, looking at the throughput, looking at latency measurements, and then just making sure that you're not going to see unwanted behaviors as you start stressing that system. 
this is going to become increasingly important. So I, as I said, we've already started to see uh, broadband solutions and broadband deployments where you're rolling out with multiple access points. Uh, those multiple access points are likely being targeted towards the five gigahertz space. And so five gigahertz has less penetration through walls and other uh, media. And so that you need these multiple access points to actually cover the same size uh, area as you might have needed with a, a 2.4 gigahertz access point. And so then you, that speaks to needing the, some type of a backhaul. Uh, and then, as I alluded to earlier, you have the, the cross vendor solutions uh, really on the horizon. Uh, coming down, and so it's just is going to kind of open up the number of uh, interoperability uh, kind of interfaces that you have to consider as you're you're looking to solutions and rolling out the Wi-Fi connections. And that really comes back to the again, what is the the service provider challenge here? So, looking at the the, the challenge, it's really about again improving that quality of experience. Because if we remember, we went back to those kind of original axioms a poor quality of experience is gonna to lead to unhappy customers, uh, and really unhappy customers can lead to complaints or the dreaded customer churn, uh, where they, they actually blame you for their connectivity woes because the Wi-Fi really gets perceived as the internet, whether or not it's accurate uh, from a technical perspective. So if we look to like what are the answers to this, obviously we covered uh, many of the methodologies of testing uh, in the previous couple of slides. And then we're also looking to the industry's answer where the broadband forum and is actually creating really the first industry's accepted performance test plan looking at these issues. So looking really at a, a performance and a quality of experience rather than just a, a purely radiated power type measurement or a purely RF type measurement. Uh, this work was started in 2017. We're expecting the work to, to really complete and publish in 2018. Um, it has strong considerations given towards the uh, repeatability and performance requirements of the testing, uh, and that's really leading towards the ability to, again, set some type of an absolute performance set of requirements, as well as then giving service providers a tool to evaluate uh, potential equipment uh, and do uh, cross-equipment comparisons. And so it's, it's kind of a, a, an apples-to-apples -apples, uh, comparison, which is where you can, are able to level the playing field, as it were, uh, in terms of being able to understand how different devices perform. And so we're, we're participating heavily in that work here at the, the UNHIOL. Um, all of our test setup that we've gone through is, is geared towards actually implementing the test cases of that test plan. And then we're also helping to provide feedback and bring in additional test cases there to increase the coverage. Uh, as we do that, we're always continuing to augment our testing plans. So we're, we're looking to uh, kind of lead the charge ahead of the standardized testing and then with the hopes that eventually it will uh, fold into that standardized testing. We really do that through, again, the strong relationships that we have with our test and measurement equipment uh, providers uh, and that ensures we have access to kind of some of this cutting edge gear. Uh, and so if we look to where we're looking on our, our roadmap, uh, we're really uh, first and foremost uh, kind of improving a lot of the range testing, adding more uh, fine grain rotations uh, to that space so you can get a good sense of spatial analysis of a device uh, and then diving straight into the, the fairness testing and the stress receiver testing uh, as that. So again, looking at the noise scenarios, looking at what happens when you have a, an access point needing to communicate with multiple stations all at the same time. Uh, and so that's really what's on our roadmap. Uh, we'd love to hear from you uh, as well if you have questions or comments or thoughts on, on something that is interesting or you were wondering how to test that. Uh, and with that, we're going to kind of move into our Q&A portion of today's uh, webinar. Thank you, Lincoln, and thank you again for your presentation. There was a lot of great information covered. Um, we're now going to begin answering some questions. Uh, as a reminder, you can still submit your questions. Our first question is from Jason. Um, for multiple AP roaming tests, do you find absolute thresholds for AP transition? I don't hear you on that. Um, so, yes, we do see it with multiple APs. Um, and the roaming test, if you do have a very closely matched attenuation from uh, 
path between AP1 and AP2, you can actually see the client toggle path from AP1 to AP2. And this, this serves where it will really negatively impact uh, that data path or that connection between the internet and that end device. So you can see this show up as duplicated packets, you can show up, see up as increased latencies, uh, any number of issues. And so that really then can have a huge kind of negative impact on that uh, customer's uh, experience in that case, uh, where the, the perceived quality of the network really gets impinged upon that. Does any 802.11 part uh, specify how APs share information for a station switch to support multi-vendors? Um, so the, the 802.11 specifications don't include uh, the detailed control of the client, what would be kind of called the client steering. Uh, there's active work in a couple of standards bodies. Um, really, a lot of this has taken place in the Wi-Fi Alliance to kind of formalize that, that client steering between multiple access points. We've got a question here from Ted. Would you elaborate on your work with Broadband Forum? Sure. Um, so we've been working with the Broadband Forum for quite a number of years at this point. Uh, the Broadband Forum for the Wi-Fi work uh, started and kicked off in, in 2017, and, and that really came as a request from the service provider participants uh, of the forum. And so the service providers came to the, the forum really explaining that they were having an issue with this whole perceived uh, quality or perceived quality of the internet uh, being impacted by the wireless, and they needed a, a, a way to actually approach uh, the wireless testing in a similar fashion to what had been done over the broadband links testing. So if you, you think about the, the broadband testing that's been carried out for, for GPON, for DSL, for GFAST, uh, there's a lot of effort put in there for performance measurements, understanding, uh, allowing comparisons between equipment, uh, which really just uh, allows a, a good prediction of how that equipment is going to perform in the field and the, the quality. And so they were looking to be able to have a way of, of doing exactly that, but doing it on the wireless uh, side of things. And so that work has kicked off. Um, that work is, is in the form of a test plan, WT398 uh, is the draft uh, test plan. It's available to broadband forum members at this point. Uh, and from from there, it's, it's a number of test cases. It covers a lot of what uh, I, I went over today, um, but if there are additional things that we're looking to bring into that. We're looking to bring in some stress receiver testing in from that. Uh, and so we, we do a lot of uh, work where we can actually contribute those test cases to the broadband forum test plan. They try to get a, a kind of an industry accepted uh, version of that test plan. And then it's, it becomes a tool. So working uh, across different manufacturers, across different uh, service providers, where everybody's kind of on a common ground. We have a question here from Paul. Does the lab do DF, uh, excuse me, DFS testing or DFS certification? Uh, so no, we do not do either of those uh, sets of testing or certification as of yet. Question here from Matt. What TNM tools are you using to measure the performance or is that functionality built in the Octobox? Sure. Uh, so where there's a number of tools out there you can actually use to measure performance. Um, some of them are rolled into uh, the capabilities of the Octobox tool. Uh, and so that would be things like using iPerf uh, or similar where you can actually set up and, and measure the performance of TCP streams or, or UDP streams. Uh, and then we also require re uh, rely pretty heavily on uh, dedicated test and measurement equipment. So things like uh, Spirant Test Center uh, tools where we're actually able to then uh, force traffic streams through with either very specific bit rates or make very kind of fine grained measurements for those latencies, uh, as well as being able to capture and look at like out of order packets and such. And so the different tools kind of have different uh, strengths and weaknesses as it were. So like using an iPerf, you get a, a good analysis of, of what a TCP connection is going to behave like over the network but you lose some of the visibility into what happens with reordered frames and such um, because you, it, 
all that's getting hidden beneath uh, beneath the layers, as it were, uh, for the, the TCP connection being used by our perf versus actually using a tool where you might actually kind of see more of a, a raw frame connectivity uh, and then being able to look at like the out of order frames or the latencies or drop frames, et cetera. Can you explain again how I can work with the UNH IOL to test my Wi-Fi products? Sure. So the, the University of New Hampshire uh, is, is a collaborative effort between all of the, the what we call our member companies. Uh, and companies are able to join into a specific test service. Uh, and joining that test service gives you access to uh, the testing within that technology or that test service uh, for an annual period. Uh, and so it really is a way of kind of helping to build up that cost of testing uh, in a known way up front so you can set budgets easily and then have access to these type of testing resources uh, throughout that year. Can you uh, explain what devices you test at the IOL? Sure, the, so the number of devices that we're testing here at the lab uh, we really do see a, a fairly good gambit of everything from uh, access points. So those might be a standalone access point where that's all it does to access points that are built into broadband routers. And then on the device uh, station side of things, we really do see uh, any number of devices from uh, your typical cell phone, uh, tablets, laptops, uh, security cameras, and then even into kind of more of the IoT space. So we've, we've had the fun of actually testing the Wi-Fi enabled pool controller. We do have um, some time, again, for some more questions. So feel free to um, submit any questions again. Um, so typically, how long does Wi-Fi taste, uh, excuse me, Wi-Fi testing take for a device? Uh, typically, uh, a full run through the, the range testing as well as the fairness testing will take about one week uh, to make all the measurements. Uh, and then we follow that up uh, the following week in terms of producing reports and, and ensuring we have accurate data. And then if we need to go back, we can pin anything with a spot check uh, during that second week. So it's really a week, uh, pretty typical for our two week cycle. How does this testing differ from traditional TRP, total radiated power measurements? Sure. So for those that have are dug into uh, really kind of the detailed wireless uh, testing, uh, you may be familiar with a, a TRP test or a total radiated power uh, measurement. And so what that test is, is, is it, it's somewhere between an antenna test and a, a device test where you're actually looking at um, the total power that's transmitted out of a device and you're looking at that power measurement over um, the, the three-dimensional kind of sphere. So you can build up a, a radiated map of a device, as it were, in terms of the amount of power that's being um, directed in any given uh, portion or, or area or direction out of, away from that device. And you, ideally, you would want a device such as like an access point, or if you're assuming it's gonna be placed into the middle of, of a, a residence, to have a, a fairly uniform distribution of its power. Um, and a lot of the, the antenna design and the device design kind of place strives to actually achieve that. Um, what we do here is um, usually a, a really a, a few layers above that, as it were. So rather than looking purely at the RF performance that that, that radiated power test gives you, we're actually looking at the real device performance. And so you're actually involving uh, both the transmitter and the receiver of, of that device, as well as all of the processing and network layers that exist between there. And so there's, there's a lot of interactions between those layers that actually speak to what happens in the performance of the device too. And so this is where this really differs from kind of that more traditional RF only type testing. We have a question here from Jason. Um, if not Spiron or iPerf, what else are you considering for application layer reporting? Um, the, right now, those are, are really the, the two kind of predominant uh, systems that are out there for that, that testing. Um, there's kind of new work that's just getting started in the broadband forum, digging up and digging more deeply into that, that application layer testing and, and what does it actually mean in terms of application layer traffic. Uh, and, and from there, we, 
we'll probably be looking towards open source tools that are implementing uh, those specific scenarios, those specific cases. But for for today's um, work, we're we're pretty reliant on the, the IPER for the, the aspirant gear. And we have just a final question here. And once again, um, if we didn't get your question answered live today, we will address that offline. Um, so we have, who are your customers? Sure, so our, our customers range from service providers. So we, we work with a, a couple of service providers from around the world who are actually sending equipment to us before they're actually deploying it in the, the field. Uh, and then we're also working with the equipment manufacturers themselves. So, so both the, the device manufacturers as well as the OEMs um, to test either through their R&D process or part of their QA process before they're actually sending the devices to the final customer. Well, thank you again, everyone, for attending today's webinar on the UNHIOL's new Wi-Fi testing and measurement capabilities. Um, we do appreciate your time. Uh, once again, if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to um, contact Lincoln at lylavoy at iol.unh.edu. Just a reminder again, there will be a recorded version of today's webinar available for your download on our YouTube page and the IOL website, iol.unh.edu. On behalf of the UNH IOL, thank you again for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day.